It might be hard to imagine, but Riot and I existed prior to YouTube. We even existed prior to the cargo trailer. We've even existed prior to the truck. During that time, we had many adventures along with the two boys I had at the time. I didn't film her photo very much then because I wasn't on any social media and I was way more focused on making memories as opposed to capturing memories. And now naturally I try and do both. Um, but the point is, is I don't have a lot of footage from that time, uh, but I am gonna share with you what I do have. Now for the first ever Lux and Riot story time, I'm gonna share with you five horribly embarrassing stories of times that I have gotten stuck um, while out camping, gotten my vehicle stuck. For three of them, I was able to self-recover. For two of them, I did have to get professional help to get myself unstuck. It's really humbling to share these memories because they showcase a absurd level of arrogance and ignorance on my part. Arrogance because I way overestimated my driving abilities. Having grown up in Wisconsin and driving through snow banks and black ice and all sorts of uh, back roads and whatnot, I was really cocky about my driving abilities for far too long. And ignorance because I didn't bother to educate myself about driving through different scenarios like sand, which will be a theme. <laughs> And um, also, I did not learn my lesson very well after the first, second, third, or fourth time. So my hope today is either you learn from my mistakes and don't make them yourself, or if you carry on and you make these mistakes anyway, just know that you are not alone and there are other people out there that have moments of moronity and that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're completely unintelligent. It just means you don't always use very good judgment, like in the following stories. So for story one, it really started in the spring of 2016. And a lot of my stories are going to be correlated to moments where I'm taking time to grieve. So in January of 2016, my husband passed. And one of the ways that I found um, coping through the grief was to get far away, take road trips, go way off grid, go into nature and work on healing that grief. And so in the spring of 2016, I was on a road trip um, with Riot and her brother Booyah because we were going to a canine conference um, and drove from Chicago to Nevada, but we went down through New Mexico and I stopped at Elephant Butte State Park. And if you've been there, it's absolutely beautiful and you can camp right on the beach. Now in late March, early April, New Mexico is still pretty cold, so it meant that there was almost no one there. So we're pretty much alone, and, you know, I'm having these, like, travel channel fantasies of camping on the beach and healing and, you know, feeling my dead husband in the moonlight and all this bullshit. And so I drive the car right down onto the beach. We're completely isolated. Me and the dogs get out. You know, I have them swim in the Rio Grande and everything's just blissful and we camp under the stars and it's an amazing night. And then the next day we all get in. I had a Jetta Sport Wagon TDI at the time and we all get into the into the station wagon and I start it up and I'm, you know, relishing in, in such a beautiful evening. And then as I start driving, I realize I am stuck in the sand. I had like driven myself when I went to park. I just drove myself into a sand pit and it's really soft sand and there's no one around and it's like early morning. And so my Wisconsin training kicked in and I just thought, okay, sand is not that different than snow. So, you know, I'm a little bit hot. I'm a little bit panicked because I don't know what I'm going to do. And there's not a lot of people around if I really do get stuck. But I grabbed the floor mats out of my car. They were rubber floor mats. And I stuck them under the front wheels of the Jetta Sport Wagon. It's a front wheel drive vehicle. And I was able to slowly but surely get myself out. So I used the floor mats like recovery boards. The, <laughs> the time consuming part was that I kept getting restuck as I got out. So then I would have to go get the floor mats and then re put them under the wheels and basically make myself a road chunk by chunk all the way out of the beach. 
And after that, I spoke with some friends at the canine conference and they were like, girl, you need to get a winch. And I, I didn't even really understand or know what a winch was, embarrassingly enough. And in hindsight, the winch wouldn't have really helped me anyway because there was no tree really around that I could have winched myself to. There was nothing much that I could have winched myself to. But I went and I bought a, a 2,000 pound winch and I carried that with me um, through the rest of these stories. I just unfortunately never learned to use it. So it was never really helpful. But if, if you take anything away from story one, recovery boards, winch, and sand is no bueno. Story two happened that same year. It was October of 2016. Um, my husband's birthday would have been October 1st, so I wanted to take some time around that air time to get away from work, get away from the city of Chicago, and again, you know, process some of my feelings and um, work on coping. So in October of 2016, I rented a 100-year-old cabin around the Great Cap Capcapon River area, I hope I'm saying that right, of West Virginia. And it's a huge acreage. You can still actually rent it on Airbnb. So I put a link to it below because I highly recommend it. Very affordable Airbnb and awesome, completely off grid. So it was a really healing time for me to celebrate my dead husband's birthday and go on an adventure with my dogs. Now, a few days into staying there, um, I decided I wanted to do some exploration. And it looked like there was um, some tracks, some road that go up a little hill that was kind of by a power line area. And um, so I decided to drive, again, I'm in the <laughs> Jetta Sport Wagon TDI, which was my favorite car until it got uh, diesel gated. I can't believe they bought that back after I've done all these things in it. Anyway, that's a story for another time. Um, so I decided to go up this hill, and this is October in West Virginia, so you can imagine it's pretty cold, um, the ground's a little bit soft, I'm an idiot, so I'm going up this power line road hill that really a front wheel drive vehicle has no business going up, and uh, I get stuck in some, you know, the I get stuck in uh, basically grass, so the grass is overgrown. The car just gets like slippery and um, I get myself kind of turned around up there. And so I uh, was okay because really all I ended up having to do to get myself unstuck from like a grassy bog type area, I guess that's what you would call it as a bog, um, is forward and reversing. Again, I feel like if you learn to drive in snow, you're a much more capable driver when it comes to getting stuck in other areas. But I basically, you know, put it in drive, put it in reverse, put it in drive, put it in reverse. Luckily, I didn't sink myself in the process, but I was able to eventually turn my wheel and get out of the bog and everything turned out okay. So once again, I was able to self-recover just with um, some driving maneuvers and I was very thankful for that. All right. <clears throat> And then, not that much later, it was January of 2017, and right around the time of my birthday and the one-year anniversary of my husband's death, because the asshole died a few days before my birthday, um, and I say that lovingly, it's just such an inconvenient time for him to choose to move to the next dimension. So now every year around the time of my birthday, I'm like a balance of emotion. But I decided to treat myself to another getaway, and I um, went down to Tazewell, Tennessee, because that's about the furthest I could drive from Chicago with the amount of time I was able to take away from my business. Tazewell, Tennessee is kind of on the border of Kentucky. It's really, really beautiful, pretty mountainous. And um, I went and rented an Airbnb uh, cabin, a really old cabin in the woods, um, kind of like uh, the one in West Virginia. It had a big, beautiful gun range, areas to walk. And um, it was just a nice getaway again to be in nature and work on, I don't know, healing and figuring out life after, you know, a loss like that. <sighs> So <clears throat> I'm still in the VW Jetta sport wagon and, you know, I really had a lot of confidence in that vehicle because even though it, it just had the, I guess they call it four motion or I don't know what VW marketed it as, you know, cause that was a while ago, but the commercials made that sport wagon seem so capable through like snow and mud and sand. And, you know, it was supposed to be my adventure wagon. Um, that I could also, you know, bring the dogs in and stuff. So once again, I really felt 
arrogantly overconfident, not only in my driving abilities, but also in the vehicle that I had. And so the fact that Tennessee is kind of muddy in January because of snow and because of rain, I felt fine. So even though it was several miles of dirt road to get to this cabin, and this cabin is at the top of a hill. So you come in a driveway and then there's a pretty steep incline to get up to the top of this hill where the little cabin is. And, you know, my first go around, I just gunned it and I made my way up there, but it was dry. So who cares? Everything was fine. And we're in the cabin for a couple days. We're going on hikes. I'm feeling good. I'm in nature. All the quiet of everything is helping my brain be more quiet. But I run out of some supplies. So I decide, okay, well, we'll just go into town. Now it started raining and was raining for most of the day. I go into town. I do a little grocery shopping. And as I come back, I'm noticing that the sides of the road, uh, like the little ravine areas, are getting pretty, you know, mushy. And so <laughs> I don't think much of it. I'm confident and I got a TDI sport wagon, right? So. I'll be fine. So as I make my way back around the dirt road, you have to go over these little um, bump area. She had the owner of the cabin basically threw um, some sheets of plywood to make this drive a little bit easier. So I'm over the sheets of plywood. They're a little mushy even from the rain. And I come around and I come to the base of the hill and I go to gun it and my tires are kind of like, they weren't able to get very much traction. But I go, ah, fuck it, you know, I'm, I'm a cocky asshole. So I start trying to gun it up the hill and as soon as I make it about halfway, I start sliding down. And as I start sliding down, because this is a front wheel drive vehicle, as I start sliding down, the ass end of the car just starts sliding into like over into a uh, ravine area. Um, into like a ditch area on the side of the hill because it was really just like, you can think of like a little proper mounded hill. Well, it wasn't little, it was quite steep, but it's basically a hill. And so as I'm going up, the wagon just starts sliding and I'm trying to hit the gas and that makes it worse. It like makes it almost reverse um, and cock the ass end out even worse. And at some point, you know, you just gotta go, this is happening. And so I kind of just went, all right, this is happening. And the TDA sport wagon just basically glides itself down, down the hill and into, I don't know it's what you exactly call it, but it was basically like a ravine, a ditch. It reminds me of what the washes look like out here in the desert, but it's full of grass and trees and shrubs and, you know, Tennessee type, type uh, environment. And I'm just straight proper stuck. I mean, there's no way that I'm going to get <laughs> that sport wagon out. So <clears throat> me and the dogs get out and I'm saying all sorts of curse words and I don't know what to do. And it's raining and I'm cold and the cabin's way up the hill. And I mean, it's a pain in the ass to even walk up that hill because, you know, it's quite steep. And one of my dogs was real old um, and uh, kind of lame in a couple of his legs. He had a hard time getting around sometimes. And so, you know, he's hobbling up the hill and I just, I don't even know what to do. And so I go into the cab and I just leave my car there. And I go, all right, well, I got a couple days to figure this out. And I just let it go for the day. But of course, in the back of my head, I'm kind of panicking. And I figure I need to learn how to use this damn winch. And so there's no cell phone reception. It's not like I can look it up on the internet. So I walk back down the hill and I get the winch out. And I realize I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. And I'm frustrated and I'm overwhelmed. And, you know, a grieving brain is an elusive brain. And so and that was the purpose of my trip was to, you know, take some time for myself and work on healing. And so I'm not in the right mind to figure this stuff out. So I go, all right, I'm going to need help. So I just wait till the next morning. So the next morning I get up, I take a little hike with my dogs to make sure they're all satiated. And then I put them in the cabin and I realize I'm going to have to go ask for help. Now, as I'm walking down this dirt road, I realize, man, it is so muddy. I mean, I had no business trying to get up that hill in a two wheel drive vehicle. Um, <laughs> And, and I go, all right, I'm going to have to walk to the next, you know, to a house. I knew that there was one down the dirt road. There was like a little farmhouse type thing. 
but we're in a real remote area and in some of these more real rural remote areas you know people just let their dogs kind of run around and i don't know how those dogs are going to be and one of my dogs was a little reactive to other dogs so i decided i just leave the dogs in the cabin go walk down um, to the nearest house and ask them if they can call someone or if they can help me or whatever so that's what i do it took me about 30 minutes to get to the house it must have been like mile and a half two miles away and, you know, it's intimidating to walk up to a house and it's like an old, it was like a manufactured home. It was pretty run down. There's a bunch of what I call yard art out front, you know, and that means like broke down cars, kind of trashy, you know, um, yard art. <laughs> and I'm like, this, this could be real bad. I could, you know, Liam Neeson is not going to come rescue me if I am taken right now in the backwoods of Tazewell, Tennessee. And uh, I just humbly knock on the door and an old woman answers. I mean, maybe not that old. She was probably in her late 60s. And, you know, she's a little flustered as to what someone's doing, knocking on her door. And I just go, I'm so sorry, ma'am, but I need your help. And I explain my situation to her. And she's real affirming. I mean, she could have been like my grandma. She was just so sweet. And she invited me in and I sat, she gave me um, some coffee and she's like, don't worry, I know someone that can help you. And she made a phone call and she told me that it would probably be sometime that day or sometime tomorrow. So she said, just go back to the cab and try and enjoy yourself. And um, her guy, it, I think it might've been her son or something, I can't remember anymore, um, is gonna come to the cabin and help me out. So I walk back to the cabin and I get the dogs out and, you know, just try and focus on being present in the moment and enjoying my stay. Um, but I'm expecting, you know, some random guy to show up to get my car out. And eventually a uh, old beat up Dodge truck shows up and um, two guys get out and they look like, you know, country guys. Uh, one's older, one's younger, maybe his son or something like that. And uh, they, they stop where my car got stuck because my car basically slid down to the bottom of the hill into the, into the wash area. And I walk down the hill when, when I realize that they're there. And, uh, you know, the guy is just like looking at my vehicle and looking at me and was like, you're a fucking idiot, lady. And it's true. I really was. And so he explains they're going to uh, um, attach a winch underneath my axle and dragged me out and I said, yeah, I have a winch. I just don't know how to use it. And he looked at the winch that I have and he goes, this isn't going to do you a lot of good for what you have. And I went, okay, great. You know, and this is part of just being ignorant. <laughs> but they winch my car out and everything is fine. I leave it at the bottom of the hill until we leave. And um, it cost me, I think, $200 in cash. And so, so while it was time consuming, it was stressful, I had to rely on the kindness of strangers like Scarlett O'Hara, um, and it cost me some cash, everything turned out fine, and there wasn't any damage to my vehicle. And that was the first time I ever had to get help with off-road recovery. Um, but particularly in farm country, it seems like people are really prepared for that kind of thing. So if you're in that, er that kind of area, you, you ought to be okay. Hopefully that was a concise story. Now you would think that I would have learned about driving in mud after that story, but the following spring in 2018, I decided to take another road trip and I went down to uh, the bottom of Illinois into Shawnee National Forest. Now at this point of my adventuring career, I had learned to use like freecampsites.net and I was really into finding the most remote camp spots that I could. I loved the adventure of it. I loved the little bit of danger that there is involved with it. And um, I like just being away from people. It was when I really started realizing that um, I do much better in solitude than in a city. And so I wanted to go to somewhere remote. And so I think I found this on freecampsites.net, but it basically said, like, no one knows about this spot. It's like a local secret type spot. 
And I was very excited about that. So I go down to Shawnee National Forest. And as you're going into this forest road, it the road kind of stops and you just see like tracks going into the forest. And that should have been my first red flag that this might not be the best idea. Now, of course, as you start going into the National Forest, even a little bit before you get into the forest, uh, your cell phone signal is going to cut out. And you know, I had come to accept that. So no cell phone signal once again, and I'm going in following what probably were ATV tracks. <laughs> and I am driving my Jetta Sport Wagon TDI, <laughs> and, uh, and it's spring in Southern Illinois, which means rain, soft ground, should have thought that out. And I get about two, two and a half miles into the forest, and the road gets real bad. It's really soft. I mean, I can feel it mushing. I can hear mud as I'm going through. And I'm driving the sport wagon into the forest. And at some point, the road kind of just washed away. And, and there was like a mud puddle, just like a huge mud puddle. And what I should have done in hindsight is gotten out and walked and checked the depth of the mud puddle um, you know, I didn't even think about, you know, driving through water like that. I mean, I didn't think at all is the problem, but I decided to just drive through it because I could see on the other side that the road picked up again. Unfortunately, as I got into that mud puddle, it was way deeper than I should have ever tried to drive through. And I got stuck, of course. So <laughs> I, I was basically in mud up to my axle. And what made it so much worse is that there were like rocks and branches in the mud and the road had washed away. So it's an erosion mud pile, not just a muddy spot. So there's a whole lot of things to get stuck on. And essentially what happened is my front axle got stuck over a big rock and I wasn't able to move forward and I wasn't able to move backward. But I, at the time, I didn't know that my axle was stuck on a rock. And so once again, I go to the floor mat situation and I try and stick floor mats and I'm like, you know, elbow deep in mud and I'm muddy all over and it's just a freaking nightmare. And I realized this car is just stuck. Like I am stuck. And through all the action of me trying to stick floor mats under and branches under, and I had a shovel, so I was trying to like dig my way out, but I didn't, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so sometimes, you know, you're just doing things and like, they don't even really make sense, but it's like some action is better than no action, I guess. But long story short, it starts getting dark and I'm, I'm just fucked. So me and the dogs just sleep in the car, stuck in the mud, and uh, wait for daylight. Now when daylight comes, I realize I'm going to have to walk out of this forest and I'm going to have to call for help. So that's exactly what I did. Me and the dogs, we walk out of the forest and we have to walk maybe an additional mile. So we're talking, I don't know, three, four mile walk to get cell phone signal. And I don't know who to call. I don't know how to explain even where I am precisely. And so the only recourse that I could think to do was to call the sheriff. I called the non-emergency number once I was able to get cell phone signal. And I explained my situation. I said, well, well to the dispatcher. And I said, well, what would you recommend that I do? And she goes, I'll dispatch a sheriff. This isn't the first time that this has happened, which gave me some relief. I'm not the only idiot in Shawnee National Forest. So... It takes about, I don't know, an hour or two of waiting and the sheriff comes to the area that I'm in and I explain my situation again to him and he says, okay, we're going to have to dispatch basically off-road recovery. So there are these services pretty much in every state. The thing is, you're going to have to wait for them. So under this circumstance, the guy wasn't able to come until the next day. So the best thing that I could do was march me and the dogs back into the forest and spend another night of car camping stuck in the mud and wait for the next day <clears throat> where uh, we walk out of the forest again so that we could meet the the guy that's going to come get the car out. And he drives up and I don't know what it's called. It's like a little tractor thing and it has a big shovel on the front. And he explains that the car might not uh, survive getting out of the forest. They're going to have to basically winch it again, 
from the axle and drag it out. But, you know, he's warning me that they could bend the axle, um, you know, I could have a flat tire. The, all sorts of problems could occur. So you, know, you basically have to be okay with the fact that, yeah, you might get your car out, but it might not even be drivable when you do. Now, the sheriff was really nice. He let me and the dogs wait, um, you know, by his squad and um, was, you know, trying to uh, trying to make me feel better and not quite so stupid, although that was hard. I felt pretty stupid. Um, but <laughs> the guy drives the tractor in. I don't know what all happened because, you know, I was waiting by the squad car. But eventually, a few hours later, he's dragging the TDI sport wagon out. And he did mention to me that he left my floor mats back in the forest and uh, my front, uh, the area underneath the bumper, you know, it's really just a cosmetic thing that they put on those cars, but that had broken off. But luckily my tires were fine and my axle ended up being fine. And I was able to drive that thing out of there. Um, and that cost me, I think $350. And luckily I had cash on me cause you know, I remember from the first time that these people don't have credit card machines. So it, it, it all worked out. A lot of pride was lost that day, um, and I felt real stupid because if I had recovery boards, things could have been better. I certainly could have winched myself out, uh, most likely, if I had learned how to use that winch because there was enough trees around, so that would have been good. A satellite phone might have been helpful. Nowadays, you know, I work online, so I always have to be camped near a cell signal anyway, so I'm not as worried about it. But if you camp like how I used to camp, then uh, I would recommend maybe a satellite phone. Um, and of course, a good shovel and some common sense. Some freaking common sense would have been really helpful because a smarter person would have gone, eh, that looks suspicious, I'm gonna get out and walk. And that's what I do now uh, is get out and walk. But I hadn't quite learned my lesson because we have story five, of course. And story five is only as of last year. Now, because I had gotten stuck so many times already, I haven't pushed my limits with the Ford truck very much, even though it's way more capable. I think in a way I just learned my lesson a little bit, but once I got the trailer, I got stupid again. So last spring I was camping up in Nevada around Walker Lake. And if you're familiar with Walker Lake, you can camp right on uh, the lakeside on the beach. And then there's also camping up on uh, these little roads, little offshoots. But I saw some people that were camping down by the beach in like vans and I'm like, well, I can freaking do that with an off-road truck and an off-road trailer. And I was a little trigger shy because, you know, I've had these past experiences that I started learning from, hopefully, kind of, sort of. And uh, I was like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. So I give myself a little pep talk and I'm like, girl, come on, go, go camp down by the beach you're going to have a good time and you have such a capable vehicle. And I decided to go for it. And I'm looking kind of at the sandy area as it leaves the road. And I see an area that has some tracks on it. So I go, okay, well, this must be the area that everyone else is getting down there on. And so I start turning the truck and pulling the trailer into the sand. And I get, you know, kind of midway towards the beach. And I, I start going, ah, I'd rather park by the road. I, I think I'm more comfortable by the road. And so I try and turn around. <sighs> And in the process of trying to turn the whole rig around on the sand, I get stuck. And my old Wisconsin training comes back into play and, and I think to myself, okay, I'm gonna treat the sand like I would treat snow. So I try reversing the whole rig and then pulling forward, reversing, pulling forward. And I'm starting to dig myself into sand a little bit. I turn four wheel drive onto the truck, should have been in four wheel drive probably the whole time, but I turn the four wheel drive on then and yeah, I'm still, you know, kind of SOL. So I go, oh, man, now I'm gonna have to get myself out. So I get out, I assess the situation, I have a shovel with me, I dig a little bit of the sand out and I go, okay, I'm gonna try reversing and for, you know, pulling forward again. And I'm making a little progress as I am reversing and pulling forward. But at one, I would go, okay, I'm gonna punch it. And in the moment that I punched it, I ended up reversing right over the trailer with the back quarter panel on my truck, which I'm sure some of you have seen in other videos and maybe wondered what that body damage is from. And it's for me getting myself unstuck in sand. Now, on the positive, the moment I kicked back into drive and pulled forward, I got myself unstuck. So I was able to self-recover 
albeit with some body damage. And things would have been a lot easier if I had something like Max Tracks recovery boards with me and some common sense. But, you know, with all these stories, at least I have stories is kind of how I see it. And maybe you guys can learn and take away winch that you know how to use and you have hooked up right. Recovery boards, something like Max Tracks, because I guess they're worth the money they last, where some of the others I hear don't. Um, a shovel, cash, just in case you got to pay someone to get you out. And maybe being more conservative on your adventures until you really feel capable or you know what you're doing. But at the worst case scenario, if you do get stuck, if, if you don't take away any morals to these stories, um, then at least know that other people get stuck too. People get stuck all the time. And that's kind of what like that sheriff down in Shawnee National Forest was telling me is people get stuck all the time. Even back in Tazewell, Tennessee, when those country boys came to get me out, to winch me out, they said, you know, I'm not the first one that that's happened to. You know, there's a reason that they have that recovery gear on, on their trucks. Um, of course, you don't want to be in those situations, but it's kind of like one of those things where it's it's all part of the fun. It's part of the adventure. So I don't regret anything. Um, and now I get to share it with you guys. Now, <laughs> now, thankfully, I am hard-headed enough that there might be another recovery story yet to come. And now I get to share it with you guys because I started, you know, the social media stuff. So only time will tell. But I hope that you learned something. I hope you got something out of this. Or at least you have that more sense of, hey, it's okay if shit hits the fan and I do something dumb because at least I'll have a story to tell. So I hope you enjoyed this video. You got something out of it. If you did, please consider hitting the thumbs up button and potentially subscribing. And we will see you next time. Right, Riot? All right. Bye.